Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space. And I don't know, I'm kind of looking forward to today's hangout. It's just going to be me and Carol talking about Hubble today. Uh, we're going to get an update from her on the Hubble Space Telescope because we've all heard lots of things in the news. And Carol's going to help set us straight on a lot of this stuff. And so, but I want to let you guys know we are live. We are streaming on everything there is to stream on, on all the things. But I do have a favor to ask. I have, I just bought a new sound mixer in the comments and the chat. Will you guys please let me know how this sounds and if it's not, if it's overpowering or what I think I've got all the levels right, but you guys will most definitely let me know. So please do. Um, anyway, so today we're, like I said, we're going to be talking about the Hubble Space Telescope. I, we are streaming on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook, and I'm looking at all of these things, but I also have a Discord server that I'd like you to also use for questions and comments today, uh, so we can, uh, we'll be happy to, to get to all of them. Now, these Hangouts are sponsored and endorsed by the American Astronomical Society, um, who makes, who brings these to you each every other Thursday, I guess now. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring everybody up. Hi, Carol. Hello. Uh, you are up and <laughs> you are at your office today. So, uh, um, yes. How have you been? It's been a while. You know, I feel like I haven't seen you in a really long time. I know. It's, I know. I've been, been traveling everywhere. Yeah, I have. <laughs> anyway, I, I'm hoping this is calming down. I'm getting a little sick of it. Are you going to be, you're not going to be doing a lot? I am sick because I did get a, a cold. Eventually it came to roost. So, yes. I'm, I'm back in Baltimore. Good. Well, I'm glad that I'm glad to have you back here. And the, um, uh, you want to just talk a little bit about the Astro Coffee Hangouts, what the spirit of them is, and, and maybe talk, sure. talk about the AAS just a little bit? Absolutely. So at most research institutions that I know of, um, uh, and at Space Telescope, we have uh, something called uh, Science Coffee or Astro Coffee. And the idea is to get people together informally to talk about research they've been reading about. And very often we have um, a guest you know, either might give a colloquium or we have special guests at our institution. Um, and uh, they often give a colloquium, but we like to get behind the scenes with them and actually talk to them in, more informally about uh, their research, uh, what research they're going to do, what research they did before, and get some of the details really informally from the person's perspective rather than only through a refereed journal. So we thought it'd be great if we could do these kind of informal discussions about ongoing current research with all kinds of astronomical facilities um, with the researchers doing them. So that's the idea. And uh, so we call it Astro Coffee because that's what it is. That's right. And I have, actually I have water today. I don't even have tea, but I have my new space telescope coffee cup. Oh, those are nice. Oh, so you've got the, it's got the JWST on it. STSCI, and it's got Hubble on the end. Are they going to change the logo when uh, JWST launches, do you think, to move? Because <laughs> I like the logo. It looks really cool, what the Institute yeah, has. Yeah, and HST doesn't actually have a logo. We just have stuff. We may, you know, silhouette or something. It does have a unique, a, a, a recognizable silhouette, so we kind of just use the silhouette. Yeah, and you know, that's something that I think I would like to clarify a little bit because I was confused about this when I started working at the Institute. Hubble is a NASA-operated great observatory space telescope, yes. one of four that was launched. This was launched in 1990, but it's not operated directly by NASA. It's operated by the Space Telescope Science Institute. It was. Well, it is now. Back. So what happened was, yeah. I'll tell the little history. Um, originally, it was operated by Goddard Space Flight Center, okay, which is part of NASA. So there was a big control room. There was a dedicated control room for Hubble when it first launched all through the servicing missions. Um, there was an idea, and I worked for another telescope during this time, um, another NASA telescope. There was an idea of consolidating a lot of the operations and and having operations not at Goddard, but maybe at like Marshall or Johnson Space Flight Center, because a lot of the shuttle operations are at, at Johnson. And basically the scientists and engineers didn't like that. And so we, we were already doing health and safe, safety monitoring of the telescope. And so for a while, the control facility that was at Goddard was actually moved and we had a special room for that and we we moved so there were health people looking at health and safety of the telescope as well as the instruments but they weren't actually sending doing the commanding 
So the commanding people came up and they operated here for a number of years. And then it was decided, um, okay, okay, uh, we'll take it back to Goddard. But in that spirit, now we, we are going to have a big hand in operating James Webb when it finally does launch. So we do have a new control room at Space Telescope for James Webb. Um, other telescopes followed suit. I mean, there were some other telescopes that are operated out of universities and other research uh, institutions. Now, the ground system stuff is always done through a NASA facility. The data comes down through a NASA facility. Um, there are usually people who work for NASA who are checking that stuff. Um, but in, in, the, in the case of Hubble, even though the stream was kind of monitored or quick check at Goddard, then the, the stream was sent to us for, for all the operations. Um, it was also true that during servicing missions in any kind of an anomaly, uh, we always transferred control back to Goddard. That was even when, even when the control room was in Even when the control Baltimore. room was a space telescope. And okay. so if there was an anomaly, then there was a whole bunch of telecons you know, face to face via video, and then a bunch of us went down there, uh, and and they fired up the full control room, and they did stuff there if there were real problems. Because then they had all the all the resources, all the engineers on site that could deal with any problem. And servicing mission because it's so tense, they always did from there. But there was there was a period where the control operations, the actual Absolutely. pointing, was done, yes. and that building you're in now. Yes. And but well, it's, I'm not in that building now. But well, oh, you're right. That's right. That's, that's, that's it's under to another building. <laughs> you're now yeah. up the hill. That's right. <laughs> yes. 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 But yes. when you yes. were in there, and when I was in there, then that was the building, the main building. And now, of course, as you point out, almost all of the fourth floor of that building is being allocated for the control room of the James Webb Space Telescope. So, yeah. but I guess what I'm trying to get at here is it's kind of weird. You've got NASA building and operating or building and launching the telescope. And, and, but then for, they have a contractor, which is STSCI, uh, that is operating it kind of at least off and on, but the operations and the science is driven at, at the Institute. And the yeah. Institute is a, part of a bigger organization called aura which yes. is the uh, uh what is it called association for universities and research of right. astronomy or something like that and they operate observatories around the world so it's all interconnected in kind of a strange way um, well actually when i was at berkeley i worked on the extreme ultraviolet explorer and we operated out of berkeley imagine that that was really a problem i mean nasa couldn't even conceive of that but we operated eube out of nasa we had an operations and in fact, I was deputy PI for a while. And so I was on the hook to answer questions if we had anomalies. So we ran that telescope um, on Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley, um, actually in a separate building from the university, but we were all university employees. We didn't have any NASA employees. So it's not that unprecedented. Um, as far as a great observatory, as part of Chandra was operated as well. So there are a tel astronomical telescopes that have been um, operated by outside. And also Landsat was often, some of those tel those telescopes, earth Lakeing telescopes were operated outside. So it's not completely unheard of. And a lot of the people who work at Goddard on NASA now are contractors. They're not, they're not civil servants. That's right. That's right. I, I wasn't, when I worked at the Institute, yeah. I was, I so, was an aura employee. That's you right. Know, it's kind of a mishmash depending on on really what the need of the telescope is. Um, you know, in the case of Hubble, the, the servicing missions are pretty intense. Once a telescope is operating. I know. I wish I had been around during the, I, I joined in 20, uh, 2012. When did I start the Institute? Was it 20, 2010? I started in 2010, which of course was right a year after, after yeah. the last servicing mission yeah. in 2009. So I missed all that excitement, but I would love to have been around yeah, during one was, of those, uh, yeah. during one of those periods. Okay. Well, so as you know, uh, everyone out there, the Hubble Space Telescope launched in 2000 or in uh, 1990. And it's been, we are working on our 28th year, uh, in yeah. operations and, uh, April will be 29. And of course, it's lasted this long because of servicing missions, of which there have been five throughout the years. And the last one was 2009, as we just said. And when they went up there, they put up, they basically gave it a whole new setup. It's a completely yeah. new telescope after that servicing mission. And among the things that they did were replacing and updating the 
gyroscopes. And um, yes. so, Carol. It was actually a very scary mission because they had a lot of stuff packed into a week. And they had to, we had to make decisions about exactly what was going to be done. And so, you guessed it, the instruments were important, but they had to, they knew they had to worry about health and safety because if the telescope didn't work, it didn't matter whether there was an instrument on it or not. So, but those guys, bunch of heroes in that servicing mission they got everything done they even had an extra day to take pictures i know so <laughs> how they got it all done i don't know they were really very tired when they were done but they they did it all well there so. was an eye yeah, on top of it all i think they also made an imax during that servicing mission yes, exactly. uh and that There's movie was actually pretty cool videos that mike massimino managed to yeah that's right oh we should you yeah. can find those those are actually the gems that's the behind the <laughs> that'd be great anyway <laughs> well the hubble uh the hubble was designed to be serviced by uh the space uh, shuttle which is no longer in operation so now that's it i mean what we have with hubble we have with hubble and can you i guess i think i because we, we're learning a lot about these gyroscopes can you explain to us a little bit about why they're so important, what they are, and why they're so important. Right. So, actually, uh, let's take a look at the at the pointing control system. Okay, I've got it it's up. It's a graphic, not a not an not an image. It's not a photograph. It's called Hubble pointing control system. Yep, I've got it up. Go ahead. And and so it has a, a graphic which shows uh, in the upper right. It shows the location of um, essentially three important aspects of the telescope which have to do with pointing. One is the fi fine guidance sensor, um, which is a sensor that finds uh, stellar objects and guides the telescope very finely, hence the name. Then there's the gyros, and, and then there's the reaction wheels. So reaction wheels um, are, are the opposite of fine guidance sensors in some sense. They're, real, they're, they're more massive, they work on the idea of inertia, so the, you spin them up and you spin them down. So there's no propulsion. It's just a, a, a torsion spin up, spin down, operating off of the solar panels, which fire up the batteries. So it gets the power, all the power is self-contained. It has nothing to do with propulsion or nuclear power. And the reaction wheels spin up and spin down and do the inertia. You can point with reaction wheels. Um, their react and this setup is very similar to other telescopes, Kepler and other telescopes, Chandra or whatever. Um, the gyros, uh, the way the gyros work is like similar to a bicycle wheel. If you spin, you spin something, you can turn it in certain directions, but not in others. And so, typically, the idea was to have three. So there are three, one along each of your axes. Uh, and that defines, so you can orient it so that um, you can you can combine the signal from three gyros to uh, tell you where you are in space. And so typically what we do with the pointing system is <clears throat> we, we in, it's pointing very finely, tiny little, tiny little corrections while it's observing. And then we start to increase the rate of the gyros, might use the reaction wheels, to slew the telescope at a higher rate, because if we use the slow rate, it take forever. So we slew from one spot to another, and it's a whole art to schedule things so that you get the right target, also that you minimize the amount of slewing done with the telescope, because you don't want to let, you don't want to spend all your time moving from one place to another. You want to move and get there. And, and then you settle down, the fine guidance sensor captured, and captures, um, um, the field of view, and then there you are. And then the, the uh, so it's, it, you have to slew, you have to get to the right place, first of all, and then you basically focus down to get exactly on the target that you need, and you need very precise pointing for that. And so um, this last bit of keeping it, of acquiring at the, at the last bit, and also the font and pointing require, requires these gyros. The gyros are, you know, they're a million years old. There are gyros on boats, on airplanes, satellites. Gyros are very common. Um, inertial systems for pointing um, and determining a heading. But basically, it's something that spins and that's resistive to turning in some directions and, um, and, and moves easily in another direction. That's the point. 
And That's a basic idea. So, so in the graphic, it shows you that the, the reaction wheels are kind of up uh, in the telescope assembly, and then closer to the back end is the, the are the gyros and the fine guidance sensor. And then there's a graphic also that shows um, fine guidance sensor, and then what are called the star, star trackers. And the, the star trackers are the things that actually lock onto a star in the field of view. Fine guidance sensor gets you guidance close, but the star tracker is the thing that holds it in place. And it's, it's and the then, reaction wheels, not any jets or anything like that that keep no, it. No, no, it's all mechanical. Right. It's, yeah. all, it's all angular momentum, spin up, spin down. Which is a good thing because you, yes. run, you tend to run out of things. Absolutely. That, 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 because you can't, that, that thing just needs to be able to spin up and spin down by acquiring power, which you have from the sun and the batteries. So um, that that's kind of your fail safe. There's also, there's also something that um, on a telescope that is, is a sun sensor so that, and the idea is that if, if you get in trouble, what you do is you want to orient the telescope so that as it orbits um, the back end of it, uh, is facing towards the sun that the mirror is not facing towards it. You can, you can shut the mirror cover. <laughs> it would be a bad day, but, but you don't want to do that. So basically the rear end of the telescope um, points towards, towards the basically the sun. And then, then the mirror points to deep space during the whole orbit. Now I heard a story. I don't know if, but I don't know if this is true. Maybe you can tell me if you know the that 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 front cover, that flap that you see in the in the end of the tube, that has never really ever been closed, has it? Yeah, Once it's don't. been open, you people know, are the, scared to <laughs> people are scared to put it down for right. fear that it won't that, come yeah, back up again. There, there's always there has always been. I mean, once it was open, it was open, and so <clears throat> there's always been a, a concern. For example, um, when we have meat. Um, meteor showers and, and the, the Leonids and Perseids and all that of knowing where, which direction they're coming from. And very often they've tried to do point, they used to actually just point away from it, but now what they do is point it so that um, we basically don't want to be looking right in the direction where of a meteor, meteor shower, <laughs> from, but we can still observe. We just, we just would prefer it. That none of that stuff comes down the tube and hits the mirror. Yeah, that's right. But there are, there are, you know, the surface of the telescope is has little pock marks. And if you ever go to the Air and Space Museum, you can actually see <coughs> that. Um, um, Wife of Camera Two um, is there, and they, they actually carved out pieces of the metal. It's one of the wedge-shaped instruments, and they carved out pieces of it to extract the micrometeorites and analyze them. They they were a little bit overachieving when they did it. They they kind of made Swiss cheese out of it. They didn't have to, you know, destroy it that much. They could have been a little more gentle with taking the stuff out because when you look at it, you get have the impression that the micrometeorites were like golf balls, but that they, they weren't. They were just little pieces, and they just scooped them out like with a melon scoop. That's what it looks like, but they. They didn't need to make such big holes in it. So the anyway. wide the wide field camera too that was taken out in one of the servicing missions is now in in, in, in the Smithsonian. Smithsonian, and you can and actually so is see Coast Star, which which actually was put in when the oh it the, is Coast Star was the, the glasses mission one is the twenty fifth anniversary of servicing mission one is in December of this year, so twenty five years ago um, in December that really so, I think December fourth or something that really chased the change the course of history and science with the telescope because that's what restored it to its um, image quality and, you know, made a lot of, you know, 25 years of science possible. That's right. Okay. So boy, you gotta, I got to get down there to see some of this stuff. The, uh, the gyro, okay, let's get back to the gyros. Cause we recently, okay. there was an incident recently a few weeks ago where Hubble put itself into safe mode um, or, because of the gyroscope situation, you want to describe that to us a little bit. What that incident yeah. was? So, so actually, a little a little bit of history is that um, I, I wanted to see if I can actually find the date. Uh, I'll look in a second, see if I can find the date. Um, the I did have. Uh, 
I had the exact dates, but anyway, um, gyros, various gyros were re replaced in various servicing missions. Um, in 2009, the last servicing mission, it was decided to put in six gyros, two uh, or of a more of a, I don't want to say traditional. They, they worked for many, many telescopes. And then there were three new ones. Um, so there were six. And, three and new all. style or different design, yes. right? Yeah. And um, we can actually, we can bring up, how about that one picture, which is set, which is called HST Gyro. Okay. I've got it up. Which is actually a picture of one. Yeah. And unfortunately, guys, that's as big as I can make it. It's a small. Yeah. Image, it's but... not, it's not a high, um, high resolution one. Okay. Um, so there were new gyros. Four were replaced in 1993. I did find the dates. All six were replaced in 1999. And then in 2009, all six were replaced again. So of the six, uh, over the last 10 years, um, we've had, we've, uh, we've had two failures, um, which we call gyro one and two, um, two of those gyros failed. So we have, we're left for four. And, uh, as I described before, because we use each gy uh, gyro for each axis, we have three axes. We want to operate with three gyros. We prefer not to use the fine guidance sensor or the, the, um, reaction. Modes. So, um, because it gives us the best pointing and the best stability and the best science comes out of it. Okay. I was, so, about, I was about to ask you to follow up on that. The gyro has been exhibiting unhappy. I, I say it was exhibiting unhappiness. <laughs> it was, um, it was misbehaving for quite a while. I think it's about a year or more. And and the idea is, well, well, what do you do about that? Do you shut it off and just use the remaining three? Or do you try to live with this annoyance and operate three gyros knowing that you have still one in reserve? So the idea was to monitor it. And of course, there are several engineers that they spend all their time worrying about the gyro fail rate and plotting graphs and is it going to come soon and all that kind of stuff. So it's been jittering around and we've been kind of living with it and we have to make some compensation for it and the science pointing, but basically we've been surviving. And, and then recently that one gave up and they couldn't make it work again. So they said, okay, it finally gave up. We're, we're done. Um, now we have three gyros, which are not operative. And then we have three more and we're going to operate on those three because we prefer to operate on, on three. So they, they fire up. They already got two of those working. So they fire up a third one and the third one starts misbehaving. And so it's, it's sending out signals and not behaving and not allowing pointing of the telescope properly. So at that point, the telescope, um, because it can't prop, uh, point properly, is essentially put into a safe mode again. And the idea is to take take a breath, <laughs> take a big breath, and try to decide what to do. So, of course, there's not just one path. There's not just one decision. There's a decision tree. There are many factors. Um the predictive power of engineering as what you know, like, can we get it back and can we operate on through three then separately? If we can't get this one, you know, can we, can we fix it some way and then operate on three? Um, can we, if it doesn't come back at all. So I, I think in the decision three, there was never a, a, a decision not to try to get it to work. So it was like, we're going to try to get three to work. But separately, people have to worry about, okay, what if it doesn't work? Then we have two gyros. What are we going to do? So you can argue, you know, amongst yourselves, what would you do if you're in that situation? So let's go down that path. Let's say we can't get the, the, the gyro, the third gyro back, and we only have two. What are you going to do? We know we can operate on two gyros and also use magnetic fields to assist um, the pointing. Science will be degraded a little bit, but we can do that. Another choice is 
to try to get to use um, magnetic fields and reaction wheels and the fine guidance sensor and all of that and only use one gyro. So why might we do that? Well, we might do that because we have two gyros and if we operate one and it fails, then we have another. If we operate two and they fail, we're done pretty much. So there are people, you know, engineers who are looking at every scenario. Can we get it back? What's wrong with it? What happened? If we get it back, how can we avoid doing whatever we were doing again? Because in, in all things, if you have a failure, what you want to do is go back to think about what you just did and reverse it if you can, or at least analyze what you just did um, to avoid that in the future. Uh, so there's that. You also want to diagnose what the heck's wrong with it. Um, and then there's another path. What if, what if we use two? What if we use one? So lots of people are worrying about this stuff. And then you have to get everybody together, um, hash it out. And so there's an anomaly review. There's a whole board of people. And then there are other people up the food chain who have to review the presentations and decide what to do. So um, there was the, the backup plan then was, and, and there have been a lot of theoretical, um, you know, looking at the performance of the telescope and how to actually do operate on two gyros. There was a test a long time ago to try to operate it that way. Um, there's also, there's been a whole plan already developed in the, around 2008 before the servicing mission of operating only on one. So this isn't like brand new. It didn't just happen a month ago. We've been thinking about operating this telescope for years with two gyros or one gyro because other satellites have done it too. It's not, this isn't the first time this has ever happened to a satellite. And so, also, I'm sorry, Carol, but before the last servicing mission, there was also some issues with gyros that had yes, it run, running, yes. right? So Yes. So it's, it's, you've been there before uh, with, with the gyro exactly. situation. Uh, with and, a couple. Um, I think IU, IUE, which I think lasted, I don't know, some like 15 years. I don't remember the exact. IU, IUE, what's that? Uh, ultraviolet telescope. Oh, sorry, sorry. The International Ultraviolet mm -hmm. uh, Explorer. Uh, smaller telescope only in the ultraviolet. Um, it operated actually on um, one or two gyro, I think on one gyro for a while as well. So, it, it's, and that was like way back. So, um, you know, it, telescopes have operated in these modes before for substantial periods of time. And uh, so it, th this isn't all brand new and, oh, my God, you know, they just are figuring out the last minute. This stuff has been going on since. The I telescope. know. But, Carol, do you realize the, the, the month that space telescopes had been having leading up to that? Right. I mean, everybody was already anxious. Kepler's out of gas. And then right, they, Chandra yeah. had safe mode issues. So, you know, we were in, everybody's like, whoa, are they all dying? <laughs> well. You know, you put them up there and don't replace them. Well, that's just it, isn't it? I mean, and yeah, and, yeah. and another thing to all of these space telescopes credit, the great observatories and Kepler, um, these lasted way, way beyond. They lasted, uh, and and we've done hangouts on them that, yeah. uh, that that these telescopes, people are clever. They will operate this, this hardware as long as we can, and we'll try to figure out ways to operate it in ways that we originally didn't envision. So... The studying um, operating Hubble in all these different modes has been going on for a long time. And if, if people are, I mean, it's pretty gritty stuff, but you can go online and Google it and say, two gyro study. I mean, the engineers have written papers, put it out in the public, presented it at engineering meetings, had discussions. It's not like this is all behind closed doors. It's all completely open literature because, you know, we want the expertise of people in the field. And so, um, not every gyro expert works on Humble. They work on lots of stuff. So you want to get that community together to to um, share expertise. And so these studies have been done for a long time, presentation after presentation after presentation over the years on how this would be done. And so when it actually is needed, then you you you've learned a lot, but then you have to move forward and find out what else else uh, you've learned. So that the, the uh, <clears throat> the situation is now, and actually there was a, uh, our project manager, the program manager 
was interviewed by the Washington Post, but also misquoted by a number of media that he said, we just turned the telescope off and then turned it on and everything's working. Well, <laughs> rebooted it. Huh? <laughs> think, think things were turned off and on that, and no one master switch turning off and turning on has reset this, but a number of tests are being done. Um, they're checking out their theories on it, analyzing all the data and, we know that progress is being made. And so if they get the gyro to the state where they're kind of happy with it, and it, it, it sounds to me like, you know, might be close. Um, then what you have to do is you can't just fire it up and start exercising it all over the place. You need to do some tests, um, understand exactly how you created the problem try to avoid doing that problem. Who knows? I mean, I'm sure the engineers want to repeat that thing over and over and over again. But, so so the know, misbehaving... That, 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 just because they want to study it. On the other hand, us scientists are like, don't monkey with the gyro. If you get it fixed, like get the telescope operating. So, you know, it's there's all kinds of argument on all sides of this. Engineers want to understand the whole problem, and the scientists want to get their science done. And it's not clear that both both goals can be satisfied. <laughs> it's tug of war, right? Yeah. So, so the misbehavior. I, mean, I understand the the research aspect of it from an engineer's point of view, but, but I also think the telescope was not an engineering test model. It's an actual okay. operating astronomical facility, and we ought to get it back. Well, there's also a time allocation problem. You, it's got yes. it's got work so to do, just, and it's yeah, been allocated. We just had our talk, actually, and so the 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 recommendations of which is the best science um, are in and being pondered by um, the director and uh, the TAC. Uh, so that complicated things a little bit, but but and now we are stacking up science that hasn't been done. Okay. So right that, um, because of the delays. I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I would guess that, it, I would guess that what we want to do is try to do things that are sort of normal operations, not do anything exotic. You know, if, if that third gyro that failed is, um, is the one that, that exhibited bad behavior is brought to heel, then operate three gyros, but do it in a sensible fashion. Don't, don't try to do the most ambitious program you can think of. Just, you know, let's resume normal operations, um, play it by the book <laughs> and, uh, and move forward. So okay. we're all hopeful that that's the scenario that we're going to see in the next two weeks or so. Great. Okay. So but I know there are engineers who want to test it all over the place. <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> so Hubble. They always want to do that. So, Hubble is one of the most oversubscribed pieces of instrumentation we've ever built. So, uh, yeah, this has an impact. And engineers, while they do want to get things right, there is an a, an abundance of caution can be a little bit too costly. It sounds like so. So the they 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 as you said they're working on the 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 last gyro is still getting its uh, its work out. It's um, they're still getting a, a sense of how temperamental it it is uh, and. This will, it is affecting the observing schedule of Hubble right now. Oh, yeah, of course. Because every minute is scheduled. So we're, we've are we been down for uh, several weeks. So um, the way the schedule is built is, uh, again, we, ha we have the constraint of the science, like what needs to be done. Um, and all this is peer reviewed. So there's a huge peer review panel that looks at all the science. We're vastly oversubscribed four to five and, and m almost all of those proposals are award winning. So you have a one in like four and a half chance of getting time on your proposal. Um, we also have programs that are continuing programs from before. So, uh, we have these things called multi treasury programs and those for proposals span several years because they're bigger programs that the program isn't done in one year. It's done over many years um, to put all the data together. So there's those programs that are, some of them are still sitting in the hopper. Some of the observations on those programs have already been done, but the rest of the observations have to be done in order to complete the set. And then there's 
there's always residual observations from the cycle before. Um, we're kind of at the end of a cycle now, and then pretty soon the time allocation that was just done, we're going to start up uh, those. So those all have to be interleaved. They were put in a really nice schedule, and then we've been down. So now that all has to be reshuffled to find out. I mean, cl clearly the part of the rest of Part of it is that if there are individual observations that are going to be made, got high marks, you don't you don't want to be just stopping in the middle of the observation saying, oh, too bad. So if we can recover the rest of those programs, then that's a consideration if they can be done elegantly. And then sometimes there are places in the sky where you just can't you just can't see that part of the sky at this at, at the time of year. So one might have to wait. So all of those parameters go into scheduling a telescope. And then when you have a hiccup like this and you have to redo the whole schedule. Yeah. Um, I, like, I like how you said at the beginning where you were talking about the gyro problems where you said, okay, so it failed. The first thing everybody does is they just breathe. Yeah. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> I think if I worked at NASA like that, that's what I would have a, it would be a big sign over my desk. It just says breathe and nothing else. Just take a deep breath. Yeah. Cause if you, you have to work... do that and not, you just have, the first thing is make, make sure the telescope is safe then, you know, and that it's going to continue to be safe and then figure out what you're up against. Cause you know, you never know. It could have been gyro, but there could be something else. There can be a computer glitch. There could be a, an antenna glitch. It could be something else in the systems. Um, so you don't want to just get hyper focused on one thing. You want to make sure all the other systems are working. So you have to you have to diagnose that as well. And this thing has like all kinds of data that comes down. You know, lots and lots of data that come down from it. So you can check all those systems and make sure that every little piece of Hubble is is working as it should, except for this one thing. And it's and so far that's the case, isn't it? I mean, the the job the gyros are always a source of of um, of twitchiness for for everybody, but the the telescope as a whole, the observatory as a whole, uh, is in pretty good shape, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right, I mean, absolutely. Cameras Better are working, and, and, and the instruments are working really well. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's in great shape. Okay, well, um, well, uh, time for a little bit of conjecture here, Carol. This is just I need your opinion on this, and I trust it incredibly immensely. So I'm sure that you have some insight on this. Um, we all know the James Webb Space Telescope has been delayed until 2021, and it's going to be years and years now before we see that thing go up. Uh, and at the time, there was some hope that the two telescopes could operate in conjunction with each other at the same, you know, be up there at the same time taking data. Do you still think that's possible, or are we pushing it now with Hubble? I think we're very hopeful that if we get this sort of gy gyro to behave for a while, I mean, they, it, people are... <laughs> engineers are going to be on these gyros like all the time, you know, they're mm -hmm. monitor every single little glitch and every, every single little signal watching to see there's no indication that I know of, but I don't, I'm not an operations scientist or engineer, so I don't know, but I haven't heard that there's anything particularly wrong with the other two. And, and, I, and I actually believe, so of the six, there were three that were this more, I hesitate to use the word traditional, but there was a, they were older style right. and then a newer style, although they all operate in that similar way with a whirly gig in the middle of a ball that's it's isolated and then that thing floats in a fluid. So that's how they're made and that's what that picture shows and there's actually an exploded view, but I'll show that exploded. Anyway, that's how, those, that. that's how those that's how those starters work. So the, the three new ones are the ones that are left. And so there was no anticipation and two of them have been operating with this flaky one. So that we've had three, we've had two newer ones, two of the older ones failed. One of the older ones was misbehaving, but it was working in concert with two newer ones. And then when they, the one old one finally did give up, then they had to turn the other one on and that's when it started misbehaving. But these are all newer vintage gyros um and so there was no expectation that anything was going to go wrong with it so i think they're just trying to figure out whether 
it was a circumstance or there's something actually wrong with it or wh what it is because it was sitting there and it hadn't been exercised yet. So maybe this is just a startup pick. I, I, I don't know. So I think two weeks ago, things there were more, it was more nail chewing, but the idea was we want to extend its life and we're looking to 2025. So we're not backing off on that mantra. <laughs> That's great. 2025 okay. is our mantra and we're going for it All and right. we'll operate the telescope. Now it may be that some of the instruments will fail, um, but we believe we will have science instruments and a working telescope through 2025. And so there will be overlap. Jane Webb, Webb will launch, I don't know, 2021. And then it'll take six months or so to do, um, check out the whole system and then eventually it'll start doing science. So I love it. I love it. There, there will be overlap. <laughs> you heard it from Carol first, folks. That's Absolutely. great. <laughs> All right. Well, let me we get to that. Uh, let me get <laughs> Let me get to a couple of questions. Uh, Uber CEO. Hey, it's like the rovers. People believe that those rovers were going to come back online after the, you know, the dust blew off of them. And guess what they did? So, I know they just kept going, and that's yeah. well, that's just it, right? So, I mean, NASA has got kind of a they got this <laughs> Scotty syndrome going, right, from Star Trek, right, where he would always understate what something you could do, but then he but he'd always come through. He, Scotty would always make it like oh, work, no. you know, okay. and and uh, it's the same with NASA. They say, you know what, we're, we're going to build this telescope in my work for five years, folks. And I don't know, maybe five years. I don't know. And then the next thing you know, twenty five years later, twenty eight years later, it's still up there working yeah. and doing things, and so. And there's no degradation in the science. We we are um, well. If anything, it's better than, than launch day. Nine hundred refereed papers per year, which is the highest per rate year. Of, wow, I did not know that. Nine hundred refereed papers a year, which is the highest rate of any facility or any science ever that humankind has ever done. So, the currency of science. Good. Good. Well, that's yeah. That is that is a lot of that's a lot of that's a lot of good papers. Okay, so. Um, Quick question from Uber COO. How can magnetic fields stabilize Hubble? You said a while back that you can use magnetic fields to kind of, if you had to. Right. The, there's an, there was an engineering study, actually, it's been quite a while. <laughs> um, um, and there's something called the magnetic sensing systems, which, uh, so the, there's the reaction wheels, there's, there's a rate sensing unit, which are associated with the gyros. Um, there's, then there's other devices which integrate the gyro output with the rest of it. And then there's, there are these magnetic sensor systems. I have the rate um, sensor gyro. So I, I'm not exactly, exactly, exactly. I'm not an operations engineer, but my understanding is that it has something to do with the magnetic field of the instrument and the ma magnetic field of the earth and, and being able to do a lot. Now that's, that's not very um, refined, but you can. Um, and let's, let's just remind you everybody why. You determine what position you're in. Yes. And let's just remind everybody why this is needed. The Hubble Space Telescope has a very, very small, teeny tiny field of view. Okay, the way it's always described to me is if you take a grain of sand and you hold it out at arm's length, that's how much sky it sees at any given time. So pointing has got to be done really well. Not only that, it also has to track and follow things as it's going around its orbit of the Earth. So that's why this is so important. Um, it's entirely possible, I suppose, that if Hubble was just left uh, with no control, you could still do some science with it. You're just going to get whatever... Hubble happens to be looking at it at any given moment, but uh, let's hope it doesn't get that that bad. Um, okay, so Andrew Planet, with faulty gyros possibly jeopardizing uh, missions like uh, uh, wait a second, with faulty gyros possibly jeopardizing other missions, in other cases, and Hubble being serviceable, could they be extracted to see what went wrong and aim and build future foolproof gyros? Okay, Andrew, let me just try and re restate that to what I think you're saying. I think I know what he means. Do you? Okay, go ahead. Answer that. Oh, okay. <laughs> go, Carol. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and so, go. 
So what you're at, yeah. what you're asking is, can we go up there and get those gyros out and bring and figure it out what? The, there are lots of these gyros around. These gyros have worked on ships, on aircraft. This is really very well known technology. So there's nothing mysterious about Hubble gyros that are any different than the ones that have been used on other satellites, and that's where it came from, the gyro system. So there's nothing stopping. I mean, th these are improved um, gyro. The thing, my understanding is that like laser gyros are not as accurate. They're good. That's what I was told, but I'm not a gyro engineer. But my understanding is that laser gyros, which work on ships, are not as accurate as these. Um, I mean, this thing spends 92,200 times a minute. And so it's a high rate. So it's, it is very inertial. Um, so there are all kinds of gyro designs for all kinds of purposes. And this is, I mean, if you look up this kind of gyro, it's called the gas, I forget the exact terminology, but um, that that these systems are well known. So they've been on all kinds of satellites. So, and so we've got lots of them around. So we don't need Hubbles okay. to, to diagnose the problem. There, yes. There's lots of them sitting around benches and being improved upon. And so the new ones that were put in were improved upon. The thing is though, <clears throat> so I'm a pilot. Let me tell you, just to get something in an aircraft takes years of pr proof. So put it on a satellite takes decades for it to be space qualified. So if you can think up a gyro tomorrow. It isn't going to be even on W first in 2030. Maybe, maybe it will be. It takes a long time to prove a system before it can go on a spacecraft. And it takes, as I said, it takes years for an aircraft. I imagine it takes years for a boat, although a boat, it's not as critical. I mean, a boat can float around for a while until you go there and replace the jar when you can carry lots of them. Spacecraft, you know, you have six, and they're the best engineered gyros you can put on there. So. Yeah, well that yeah, so let me just read his follow-up uh, comment. He uh, he's saying, "Why build unreliable gyros? It's always the same story. Spend lots of money on good engineering to throw it away on gyros that just don't meet reliable standards unlike the rest of the hardware." Well, that's just not true, is it? I mean, based on that's what you just true. said, it's you've the best gyros that we can do, but space is hard. <laughs> Yeah, it's we not like they're trying. It's, it's not like they're trying to say, let's build a great telescope and put crappy stuff in there that it all depends on I to mean, work. These are really good gyros. They've been proved. They aren't unreliable. That's right. A, a time and time again. Remember, they were supposed to land for the last fifteen years. But they're like a they consumable. We they, just don't have a servicing mission. So yeah, and the way I look they, at it is, it's like a cons approximately every eight to ten years. We just don't have a servicing mission. So these are the best they got. That's right. You have a ship, they replace they gyros wear, all the time. They wear out. They just do them all the time. We just don't have a servicing mission. Yep. And so that to, to have them so. last that long uh, at the precision that they're required to last says a lot about how, how reliable they actually are. Also, we have six. So. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of redundancy there. So well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so have, hard on them, guys. I mean, that's pretty yeah. rough, Andrew. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, think. So, some of these systems, they'll have three, right? But yeah. They have three in the cabinet. Yep. Um, Ours have to be on board and and not taking up a lot of space and easily switchable and all that good stuff. So, mm -hmm. right. It's and, and like I was saying before, what I always I consider them to be kind of a consumable because they do wear out. They aren't going to give you a 25 year lifetime uh, like, say, a primary mirror would. Right. They just wear out. Uh, Contour Boss wants to know, does the schedule depend on where Hubble is in relation to the Earth sun orbit? Like when you allocate, yes. okay. You yeah. Are. I mean, it orbits, it orbits the earth. Sometimes it's, it's on the sunlit side of the earth and we can't observe them. And then as it goes through the terminator, which is the day night terminator, you know, depending on the orbit, it'll go through that. And, and then it operates when it's on the dark side of the, of the earth. The main thing is that the telescope cannot point at the Earth because it's too bright. So it has to be oriented in such a way that it's not pointing directly at the Earth as it's orbiting. <clears throat> the other problem is that even if it's pointing away, there can be scattered light in the tube. 
So you have to wait until you get where it's really, really dark, just like going to the beach instead of looking at the sky from the middle of the city. You can't have a lot of sky or light. So we have to have the telescope in the darkest place. And that's when it's on the other side of the earth from the sun. So we have 40, I think it's 40 or 50% efficiency, which is nearly half the time. When the telescope was first launched, they only could observe 30% of the time. So we've almost doubled that. So it's very efficient um, as far as its time usage, but you just can't operate the telescope when it's on the sunlit side of the earth. And that's why James Webb is going way out, away from the moon and the earth. And the only thing it has to worry about is not facing the sun. That's right. Uh, and uh, Galaxia wants to know what we mean by test, by quote, testing all over the place, unquote. What does that mean concretely? Well, <laughs> that that would depend, I think, on the, what we, what you're testing. In the case of these gyros, what Carol was saying was that you, when it's turned on and it's acting erratically, you don't want to just start using it robustly. You want to very gradually work it up to find out is that you want to design tests that isolate the nature of the behavior. Now, what they've done specifically would probably take quite a bit of time to talk about. But Okay, so for example, speed it up, speed it down, move it this way, move it that way. While you're speeding it up and speeding it down, try to lock on, try to go off, go to somewhere else. If you do that, all that kind of rapid operation, that's not, you know, you it'd be an engineer's dream. But that's not how we use a telescope. And so the idea is get this thing under control, you know, go gently ramp up, Go to a target, gently ran down, lock onto the target, make sure everything's okay, and then start taking data. That's what you want to do. You don't want to just joysticking, you know, just running all around the sky, seeing if the thing will operate in every possible configuration you can think of. Use it in a normal configuration and watch it work. So, I mean, if I was an engineer, I'd want to do everything, right? Test everything, make sure it's absolutely bulletproof, but you could break it doing that. So. The idea is make sure that in a normal operation, the thing will work. Yes. Uh, if we had five more gyros that were all alive, well, you could do what you wanted. But even then, we'd say, well, we have five more gyros, so let's turn this one off and use the other one. So there, there's no scenario where a telescope that's as expensive and precious as Hubble Space Telescope is going to be given to engineers to test only. <laughs> not going to happen. That's Sorry, right, engineers, but yep. not going to happen. Yeah, get your hands off. <laughs> it's, <not> its, <laughs> it's our telescope now. It's if you want to, if you want to put up a spacecraft and put a bunch of gyros on it and move them all around and do whatever you want, go for it. But not on, not on our telescope. Thank you. Yep. So J James Dugan wants to know if those gyros are working twenty four seven, three sixty five, or do they only spin up when they're needed? No, no, they work all the time because they have to. They have to do the course lock. Yeah. They have to tell us where they are all the time. Okay, Condor Boss wants to know... The reaction wheels spin up and spin down, but they're gyro. Okay, uh, right, uh, th but those are a different system. Um, Condor Boss wants to know, what space telescopes do we have operating right now? Oh, my gosh, quite a few. Yes. So. Um, well, we have Kepler, Chandra, Spitzer, um, and you just mean NASA, or do you? Mean yeah, NASA? I think yeah, because that's a that's a big question. There's a lot of things. There's tests going. I mean, does tests qualify? And the, do you count Earth looking? Do you have? Do you count um, communications? I mean, if you're just talking about astronomy satellites, yeah. Um, so of the big ones, the the great observatories, three of the four are still up yeah. and working. So right. Chandra, just Chandra Spitzer and um, Hubble. Right. Kepler, TESS. Uh, and I believe there are a, a bunch of smaller um, um, focused studies that are done. I mean, there's things like NICER, uh, a bunch of those, and then ESA has tele has telescopes as well. And then there's then there's all the Earth looking, and then they explore the things that are doing exploration in the solar system. Right. There's a lot of spacecraft out there. There is. There's a lot of space telescopes and more on the way uh, coming as well. So it's quite a few. Um, let's see. Uh, get some, some other questions. Um, is it okay? Sarkis 722. Is it theoretically possible to redesign for longevity or are gyros a consumable regardless of design? 
Um, yeah, I theoretically possible so to redesign for. Is it theoretically possible to redesign for longevity? I, um, I guess that would mean when you get a new design, uh, or or is it possible to make a design of a gyroscope for no that is more skewed towards being long lived? I think these are designed to, to yeah. be as long lived as they can be. Yeah, I think the, the thing that. So just for fun, International Gamma Ray Astrophysics, SWIFT, um, something called Agile, uh, Fermi, Gamma Ray Burst Polar. Oh, you're looking more of the telescope. X ray. <laughs> uh, these are currently operating. So we have Chandra, XMM Newton, High Energy Transport, uh, Transient Explorer. Integral and Swift that also does X rays. Agile does New Star, Astrosat, and HXMT. There's probably that's probably Japanese. Um, then in the ultraviolet we have Swift also observed Iris, of course Hubble, lunar based ultraviolet telescope, and Astrosat. In the visible we have Herschel. Um, did have Herschel, Spitzer, and Hubble, and etc. Then there are microwave tel uh, satellites, um, radio, particle detectors, gravitational wave detectors, and then a bunch in the hopper to be launched. Yes. So, lots. and we talk about those a lot on Space Fan News, folks. So just definitely keep uh, keep up Absolutely. with that. Lots so, of them. Uh, Ryan Kornikoff or Korniloff, sorry. Um, as, has there been any serious discussion about attempting to replace smaller critical components, such as these gyros, using SpaceX Dragon, for example? And I will tell you that I did a hangout with Harley a couple of months ago on this effort of robotic, look up the robotic spacecraft um, uh, <coughs> hangout, where there are several companies out there now who are trying to make as their business model the launching of robotic spacecraft that are go out and repair things that were not designed to be repaired by astronauts. Uh, there is a new genre of businesses being built for this in mind, and I'm sure they're going to use SpaceX rockets to get there. But I thought that was interesting because that means that if you launch a satellite, a communication space telescope, whatever it is, and it's degrading and it's going to eventually fail, it might make sense to repair it using robotic spacecraft instead of building an entirely new one. And there are businesses out there uh, d that are looking into that. And, of course, one of the big ones would be a uh, big customer might be Hubble. Uh, if it does, uh, when it does eventually fail, go up and maybe uh, repair it. So, yeah, there are people, companies, not necessarily NASA, although NASA is involved, in robotic uh, repair of spacecraft that were not designed to be that way. And that, I think, is a growth industry. And it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Well, it does, except that'll never happen with Hubble. First of all, there is a whole robotic lab run by Frank Cipollina, who is the master of robotics at NASA. And he's had a plan for 20 years to service Hubble again robotically. But NASA is not going to fund that. Um, and he knows exactly how to do it because he was involved in all the servicing missions. So because it's just not worth the money? Is that why right. NASA won't do it? or what? Huh? The, they just won't, they don't see the, the value in it? NASA? Show me the money. Yeah. What are you not going to do? It's like, oh yeah, NASA has money. What are you not going to do? We're not going to stop James Webb. Mm -hmm. We would prefer not to stop w first. The scientists actually don't want to stop w first. We want to move ahead on w first. So what are you not going to fund? You're going to let Hubble die and then James Webb and do W first. Right. The yeah. person is going to have a hundred times the field of view and we'll see deeper than Hubble. So, you know, uh, amazing science is going to be done with W first. And so the question to the scientific community in, uh, in general is, do you want to keep this telescope alive forever? <laughs> and, and be at considerable that expense detrimental to the future there's only you know sorry american people you only want nasa to have a certain amount of money and it's less than a percent of the gross national product. that's right so, that's exactly you know right. it's a pittance it, it doesn't even compare to va hud or the department of defense but you don't want to give nasa anymore the general populace does not want to give more to something that they they feel is 
frivolous, you know, it's just discretionary money. So that's and, and everybody okay, keeps. And on that note, I'll just say that a lot of people feel like, you know, that, that NASA is a, is a great value for what you are spending. And if you want more of these kinds of things, you're right. That's, let's give NASA, let's give, let's give, let's right. look at the funding that we and, are giving. And also I know everybody, you know, tout SpaceX, but NASA kept SpaceX afloat for a long it time. It saved it. That's exactly, that's what people don't and, realize. And yep. Although they don't like to talk about that. In the meetings that I've been in in the past, before Elon went off the rails, when he stood in front of the space industry, <laughs> he did go off the rails. He was he was very clear that he owed the success of his company to NASA because the, and he says, "Well, NASA's our customer, dude. They put a lot of money, whether you call them a partner or a funding agency or a customer." NASA has put a lot, a lot, a lot of money in SpaceX. I'm not saying they don't have innovative and i think they do great pr uh, more power to them but to pretend that nasa hasn't put any money into spacex is just not true that's right and i think on that note we're gonna have to stop because we are out okay. of time um yeah. thank you carol this was a fun hang i love it when just the yeah, two of us can just chat because it's yeah, good. you know uh yeah. galaxia Make brought up comments everybody good yeah. questions and all that stuff about the magnetic pointing and gyros and all that stuff it's all open literature yep in the google world that's right. So uh, we will be, this is the last hangout for October. I don't think we're coming back next week, right? Because this is one of those long months where we have like five weeks. So I don't think we've got a, a an Astro Coffee next week, but we'll be back with wait, future. Wait. That's, it's Do the, we? It's first of November. Is next week the first of November? That's, next week is the first of November. The ah. 31st is a Wednesday. All right. So that's future in space. And Harley is working on that one. Yeah. And so I don't know what it is yet, but I'll sure I'll find out soon enough. It's Thursday. I have a week to know. So next week we'll be back. I will also let you guys know that we will be, um, uh, on Tuesday, we have uh telescope talk as well. And I might start, we, oh, there's going to be a, uh, I have been posting the audio of these, hangouts on the uh, deep astronomy podcast so and, and people are starting to listen to them so please check it out on deep astronomy or anchor.fm slash deep astronomy it's also on spotify and everything else so um so please check these the audio versions of these out as well okay well that is it for this time i will see you guys next week and uh, thank you all for watching and as always keep looking keep looking up <laughs> thank you bye